Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those joining us from the West Coast. My name is Hamira Osman, and on behalf of Muscular Dystrophy Canada, I am very happy to welcome you to our webinar from our new Let's Talk NMD, Let's Talk Neuromuscular Disorder series. Before I introduce today's webinar, I would like to mention that we have muted all participants, but I welcome you to type any questions or comments throughout today's session in the chat box. We have a lot of time at the end of today's webinar for a live Q&A. Please note a recording of today's webinar will be available by the end of the day on our MDC YouTube channel. With that said, let's get started. Today's weekly webinar is on autoimmune neuromuscular disorders. As mentioned last week, June is Myasthenia Gravis Awareness Month, which is dedicated to increasing awareness of myasthenia gravis, supporting those living with MG, and creating connections for the MG community. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune neuromuscular disorder. MDC represents other autoimmune neuromuscular disorders in addition to MD, MG, and we recognize the unique needs and lived experiences of individuals living with different autoimmune NMDs. In the scientific literature, the majority of autoimmune neuromuscular disorders are fall into three groups. One, the autoimmune neuropathies. And these include acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, such as GBS, the chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, CIDP. The second group is the inflammatory myopathies, which include dermatomyositis and polymyositis. And then the third group is autoimmune neuromuscular junction defects, which include myasthenia gravis and La Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. We are very grateful for our excellent speakers that can help to share trusted and evidence-based information on autoimmune myopathies and neuropathies. In advance of their presentations, I would like to thank each of our speakers for their time and expertise. First, we have Dr. Charles Kassergian speaking on autoimmune myopathies. Dr. Kassergian is a neuromuscular specialist and assistant professor at St. Michael's Hospital and the University of Toronto. He completed his neurology residency in, Tor in Toronto in a two-year neuromuscular fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. His clinical interest includes all types of neuromuscular disorders, but in particular, genetic muscle diseases. Academically, he has an interest in quality improvement for neuromuscular patients, particularly related to prevention of complications in patients treated with immunotherapy. Welcome, Dr. Kasser Dishan. Hello, can everybody hear me? Looks great, yep. Great. We can hear you well. So good afternoon, everybody. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really an honor to be um, here speaking uh, briefly about uh, this topic <clears throat> with everybody here. And of course, um, uh, with Dr. Massey and um, happy to take any questions uh, at the end. Uh, hopefully I can answer them. So um, I'm gonna be uh, talking about autoimmune uh, muscle diseases or myopathies uh, today. Um, here are some disclosures, uh, although none of them are necessarily relevant for today. Um, so I was asked to speak on four specific topics. Um, first of all, what are, the, what are the autoimmune neuromuscular myopathies with a little bit of basic background? Uh, what are the signs and symptoms of some of these autoimmune uh, myopathies? Uh, what current treatments do we use? And what is the current state of research, which is probably the toughest question. <clears throat> So just as way of uh, background, I think it's important to remember that uh, muscle diseases in general or myopathies can be best divided into those that are what we consider acquired uh, and those that are inherited or maybe even better terminology would be genetic since there isn't always an inheritance pattern. We're obviously not going to talk about the genetic ones today. Those would be, for example, muscular dystrophies. Under the acquired category, probably the biggest category that we think about are the immune mediated ones. And those are the ones we're going to be talking about today. So what are the autoimmune myopathies? Just so that we're all on the same page, it's important to note that you'll see different terminologies used for these. So we're calling, for example, in the title here, um, it, we're calling them autoimmune myopathies, but terminology that's often used uh, is inflammatory myopathies. Although that term probably isn't ideal because as we'll see, not all of them have inflammation uh, on the biopsies. The term that I use the most is probably immune mediated myopathies. And then you'll often see myositis as well with that itis at the end denoting inflammation again. So it's not maybe the most accurate term, but you'll see that used a lot, myositis. And all of the 
these immune myopathies share their a few things. And, and one of those things is that, again, we consider them acquired. They're not classically inherited disorders. Um, they uh, involve some aspect of the immune system. So an autoimmune activation that seems to target skeletal muscle and cause skeletal muscle death and damage. And although this is not universal, as we'll talk about in a second, there seems to be some response in the majority of them to some to immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory treatments. So again, just by way of background, so we're kind of all on the same page. Um, you know, we, when we, we talk about these conditions, we're talking about often things that we see on a muscle biopsy at a microscopic level. So if you consider why you become weak with a myopathy, um, uh, your, your muscle is obviously the gross muscle. Here we're talking about the biceps, uh, so the large muscle. That's divided into bundles of muscles which have fascicles in them. And each of those fascicles are where the actual muscle cell resides. And that's the level of the pathology in inflammatory or autoimmune myopathies. And here's an example of what a muscle might look like under the microscope if you were to get a muscle biopsy. So this is actually a normal muscle and you can see the way it's stained. The muscle fibers are these kind of hexagonal shapes that are sort of pinkish in nature. This looks very nice and healthy muscle. These dark circles that you see, kind of purpley blue circles on the side, those are the cell nucleus and they're all on the side just as they should be. And then in between each fiber, in between each of those hexagons, you have this white stuff and that's the connective tissue, so endomesium connective tissue, and then connective tissue between the fascicles, which we call perimesium. So again, this is what a normal muscle should look like. And here's an example for, of a pathological muscle. Um, so this is somebody with uh, necrotizing autoimmune myopathy, which we'll talk about in a moment. In this case, what you can see is, first of all, the muscles don't have that nice hexagonal appearance. They're kind of rounded, and there are a lot of different sizes. They're not all roughly the same size. But in addition to that, you'll see, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, but there are certain fibers that are a little bit lighter um, and they're filled with these blue dots, these blue cells. And those are um, what we call macrophages. They're cleaning up dead cells. And the reason this is called a necrotizing myopathy is the fibers have died. They've become necrosed and they're being sort of cleaned out, cleaned up, I should say. So the body is kind of removing all the debris. And so that's an unhealthy muscle. So how do we classify the inflammatory myopathies. Here's the traditional classification that, you know, um, probably Rami and I would have learned in medical school and even in residency probably, and it's being um, replaced by um, a newer classification that I'll show you in a minute. But classically speaking, the immune-mediated myopathies have been classified as dermatomyositis, polymyositis, necrotizing autoimmune myopathy, which in of itself is a newer designation than polymyositis and dermatomyositis. Um, and then sporadic inclusion body myositis. And I put that in red because IBM is a very different entity than the other three. And so when we talk about it, we really have to separate it. It's kind of like the, the odd one out in a way. Here is the sort of newer classification. So dermatomyositis, things that used to be lumped in that category, there is classic dermatomyositis, but there are also these other syndromes, antisynthetase syndrome, we'll talk about briefly, and overlap myositis, which we'll talk about briefly. Necrotizing autoimmune myopathy and IBM, they stay about the same, but the real change has happened with polymyositis, where basically that terminology is coming out of favor. People are saying that polymyositis is actually an exceedingly rare disease, and that if you look back at patients that were classically called poly polymyositis, and you carefully look at their biopsies and their antibodies and other things, you come to the conclusion that many of those patients, in fact, have an overlap myositis or an necrotizing autoimmune myopathy, or many of them in fact have inclusion body myositis. So very few patients would still be categorized as polymyositis, which now I would say is being reserved for patients who kind of have inflammation or an immune mediated myopathy that cannot be classified in any other way. And they end up getting called polymyositis. So that terminology is kind of falling out of favor. And so here's our new classification. Um, you know, dermatomyositis, necrotizing autoimmune myopathy, they stay the same, overlap myositis, with some people considering the antisynthetase syndrome, which we'll talk about in a second as a subcategory of that, and then sporadic inclusion body myositis, with sort of polymyositis kind of like lonely on its own being neglected a little bit as um, um, uh, of historical interest only. And I think some people think that eventually we'll get to the point where 
other, the myopathy will always be able to ca be categorized in a more specific way. And then the number of patients who have quote unquote polymyositis will gradually dwindle. So how do these patients present? Now, again, the exception here is inclusion body myositis. So with the exception of inclusion body myositis, here are the common ways that myopathies often present, the autoimmune myopathies often present. They have what we often say is subacute onset. What that means basically is it's not sudden, like a stroke, for example, but it's also not very chronic over many, many years, most of the time, the way you might get with a muscular dystrophy, for example. Um, so it's kind of in between, usually on the order of weeks to months in terms of the onset and how the, how the symptoms evolve. Patients have what we call proximal limb girdle weakness. Those are the terminologies you might hear. That basically means um, muscles that are big and close to your, uh, closer to your body, not at the extremities distally. So that would be, for example, the shoulder girdle muscles and the hip girdle muscles. So shoulder girdle being the muscles around your shoulder that help you raise your arms in the air. So sometimes problems might be lifting things above your head or reaching for objects or carrying objects. And hip girdle muscles might uh, result in problems like difficulty getting out of a chair, difficulty getting out of a car, uh, climbing stairs, or even just walking. Whereas generally speaking, the muscles further down, like your hand muscles cause, um, and your foot muscles are relatively spared. And so you might not have as much of an issue, for example, with grip strength. Again, this is excluding inclusion body myositis. Generally speaking, these disorders progress over time um, if they're not treated. They will have, uh, sorry, many of them will have other symptoms, including heart problems, breathing problems, swallowing problems, and sometimes muscle pain can be very prominent. And then um, many of you may know about the serum CK. This is the creatine kinase value. This is a muscle enzyme that we check. It's a blood test, very routine blood test. It's a, it's a sign of muscle, it's a sign of muscle damage. So the muscles will release this enzyme when they are damaged. And so often in the majority of these diseases, the serum CK will go up. Um, and it was usually normal ahead of time. And then when you get the condition, the serum CK goes up. So let's just talk very briefly about a few of these categories. So dermatomyositis um, is recognized by its very classic skin manifestations. One of those being the rash around the eyes, which we call the heliotrope rash. And then there's also a rash on the back of the neck region, the shawl sign, we often call it, where a shawl might sit. And then in the hand, over the, the back of the hand, there will often be this kind of purpley, violaceous rash. It looks a little like psoriasis almost in some ways, but on the back of the hand, which we call Gautrin's papules. And again, there are very classic muscle biopsy findings that you can see here of um, atrophy of certain muscle fibers that are very classic. We call it perifascicular atrophy. But the important point in dermatomyositis is that you can have significant systemic manifestations, including diseases of the lung that can make it difficult to breathe, diseases of the heart, which is uncommon but can occur, causing arrhythmias and palpitations. And unfortunately, there does seem to be an increased risk of cancer with dermatomyositis. And so folks who are diagnosed with this condition usually have a very thorough screen for cancers. And then there are a variety of autoantibodies and the autoantibodies are becoming a much more prominent part of the diagnosis. A few years ago, we may not check them in everybody, but now it's like a routine test. For example, at St. Mike's, we can do them. Um, and the reason they're important is they are helpful to confirm the diagnosis in the right clinical context, but they also can tell you a little bit about the disease. So for example, NXP2 and TIF1 are highly associated with cancer, whereas ME2, MI2, tends not to have cancer. So the presence or absence of certain antibodies can be informative um, in some ways. Overlap myositis, which has gotten more attention recently, basically means when you have an inflammatory or an autoimmune myopathy plus a rheumatological disease like systemic lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, or systemic sclerosis. So the patients will have features of those other rheumatological diseases. And one of the classic versions of this, and again, some people will consider it an overlap, some people call it its own disease, but the, the antisynthetase syndrome, which is basically someone who usually has an immune-mediated myopathy, but lots of other systemic features. So interstitial lung disease causing, it, causing breathing difficulties, Raynaud's phenomenon. So this is, the, this is the situation where, especially in cold weather, the hands or the digits, the extremities will turn um, like very white or very blue arthritis, so swelling of the joints. Um, mechanics hands is the term that you might hear, and that's what this picture is denoting. It's basically 
like pitting in the nails and very dry scaly skin, almost like you're someone who did a lot of manual labor. That's the, where the name comes from, as well as fevers. And again, there are very classic antibodies. For example, JO1 is probably the most commonly thought of antibody, maybe in all of the muscle diseases. It's been recognized for quite some time. And JO1 is associated with the antisynthetase uh, syndrome. So again, the antibodies are very, very helpful because if you find these antibodies, they, they denote certain things. So cancer becomes less likely, but some of these other problems in the lungs and arthritis become more likely. Necrotizing autoimmune myopathy is, is very different because there isn't inflammation. And that's why in, the term inflammatory myopathy is probably not the best term for this category of diseases. Rather than inflammation, what you have is an immune attack on the on certain muscle fibers and they end up dying. They necrose, hence the name. Patients will also often have very, very high CK values, usually higher than the other immune myopathies. And this is the one that has gotten a lot of attention lately because it's associated with the cholesterol medication, the statins like Lipitor and um, those kinds of medications. Um, and there is an association with producing this type of immune myopathy. And because a lot of people are on those medications, there are, there's often questions about that and it's gotten a lot of attention in the literature. And there are two antibodies that have been recognized, at least two antibodies, sorry, I should say, that have been recognized, SRP and then HMGCR, which has a very long name that I'm not going to try to pronounce. But this is the antibody that, sorry, this is the enzyme that the statins actually target. So there is a connection between why people on statins might get this type of myopathy and the antibody that's actually produced. So there's a connection there. And then the last one I want to talk about is inclusion body myositis, and it's very, very different than the others, to the point that sometimes, you know, it's debatable whether this should be lumped in with the other immune-mediated myopathies because it doesn't behave at all like the other myopathies. Unlike the other um, immune-mediated myopathies that can occur at a variety of ages, including juvenile onset sometimes, inclusion body myositis is really a, a disease of, <clears throat> you know, middle or older age. So patients over 50 and much more common in men about two to one, and it's much slower. We talked about that subacute onset, two weeks to a few months. IBM is usually much longer, um, a year, two, three, four, five years timeline of slowly progressive weakness. And the weakness itself is very different. So we talked about how in most myopathies, it's limb girdle or proximal. <clears throat> in IBM, actually grip is one of the first things that's affected, the ability to flex your fingers. And that's what this picture on the top right is trying to show that patient is being asked to make a fist. And because of that difficulty with the weakness of certain muscles, they can't actually bend their fingers at the extremes. And so they end up making a fist with their fingers partially straight, the way you see there. The other place that they get prominent weakness is the quadriceps. So a lot of atrophy and weakness, which make it difficult to walk. And so patients with IBM often have a lot of mobility issues and issues standing up, for example. And swallowing is very prominently affected, at least in about a third of patients. Recently, I believe it was in 2013, some anti an antibody, sorry, I should say, was discovered that seems to be associated with IBM. It has multiple names here, um, NT5C1A, also known as MUP44, also known as CN1A. Um, but it's an antibody that seems to be present in a significant proportion of IBM patients, though I will say it is not specific. So you may have this antibody and not have IBM, and that's an important point. <clears throat> and then interestingly, despite all that inflammation on the muscle biopsy, and in this biopsy picture that I've included here, at the top, you can see inflammation, for example, those kind of purpley blue dots, those are the inflammatory cells, or right below the letter B, there's a cell there that's being surrounded by inflammation, for example. Despite all that inflammation, for whatever reason, patients with IBM do not respond to traditional immunosuppression, the way other inflammatory or immune-mediated myopathies will. And that's why, again, one wonders if it really should be, you know, separated from the others in, in, a, in almost its own category. The third question that I was asked to address is the treatment. This, is, this could easily be a topic for two or more hours on its own. And rather than <clears throat> go into each treatment in a lot of detail, because we obviously don't have time for that, I like this nice summary from a recent paper in 2019 just to give us a point to, of reference to speak about. And I think the main point here, and again, I would put inclusion body myositis aside for a second. This does not apply to inclusion body myositis, but for the other types of immune-mediated myopathies, generally speaking, prednisone is still our, our first go-to 
mainstay of treatment. And in many patients, this could be enough, especially if the myopathy is relatively mild. And generally, we will treat at a relatively high dose of prednisone for several months and then slowly taper while monitoring for strength and CK value, for example, to see if there are any relapses. And then gradually, we taper the prednisone down and hopefully we can get it to a very low level or maybe even off. Um, patients who have more severe weakness, sometimes we have to add on additional therapies because we can't get the prednisone off because they keep relapsing with additional weakness or um, usually it's weakness. Um, and so we have to add other treatments, things that suppress the immune system uh, in different ways, such as um, uh, azathioprine, uh, mycophenolate, mofetil, also known as Celsept, um, methotrexate is often used. And then if it's really severe, we might use even stronger immunosuppression, though often that's not required. And patients who have a lot of severe weakness, um, especially right at the beginning, we might use intravenous immunoglobulin or IVIG. This is um, a, a blood product where it's purified immunoglobulins from a variety of patients that are then infused into a patient with a presumed immune disorder. And this seems to work for particular types of myopathies more than others. So there, seem, there does seem to work for some cases of severe dermatomyositis, as well as those statin-associated <clears throat> um, necrotizing ones in particular. So again, I, there's a lot that can be said about treatments, and, um, but this is the general algorithm that we'll often use starting with prednisone. And again, this doesn't apply to IBM because IBM does not respond to traditional um, immunotherapy. But I don't want to forget about all the other stuff. So we get really excited about the actual drugs because that's what you know treats the disease itself. But we have to remember that there are a lot of other treatments that are important for the individual patient. So when we put people on these medications, they're, they're toxic medications at the end of the day, and they have a variety of side effects that can be quite troubling and quite disabling, especially steroids. And one of those would be osteoporosis. And so it's important that we counsel people on taking a good amount of vitamin D making sure you're getting enough calcium intake. Uh, exercise is really important, and that can be extremely challenging, obviously, if you're weak, um, but getting some level of exercise and quitting smoking. If you're on multiple immunosuppressive medications, we may, you may need to be on antibiotics to prevent a type of no, a fungal pneumonia called pneumocystis girovecchi pneumonia. We talked about cancer screening already. And then the importance of physiotherapy and occupational therapy supports, both at, in the home and for mobility reasons, as well as swallowing. So often these aren't considered traditional treatments, but they are just as important in some ways as the traditional uh, medication treatments that we use. And then probably the hardest question, which is the current state of research. I have to say first that this is a very active area of research, uh, not just for drug development, but also um, understanding the actual diseases. Because as you can see, for example, polymyositis is no longer really a term that we use. And so we only, we only know about these things because of the active research going on in the diagnostic field. So the areas of research include things like discovery and characterization of different autoantibodies and, their, and the implications, because it seems that different types of autoantibody related immune myopathy seem to respond to specific treatments better than others. Although right now, a lot of our treatments are very kind of shotgun. You know, they, they treat the whole immune system without a lot of targeted therapies. And I think that's gonna change soon. Uh, as well as studies to understand what produces the disease. For example, there's a lot of inflammation in inclusion body myositis, but they don't respond to steroids, just like, uh, unlike the other ones. And why is that? And there's some, you know, discussion about what's the underlying trigger for IBM and why, did, why is there that infl inflammation there if they're not responding to um, treatments that are traditionally treatments for inflammation. And then of course the clinical trials for specific medications. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov, which I you know, peruse relatively frequently um, for patients and a lot of my patients look at it as well, there's a nice list if you look up the specific diseases. And you know, dermatomyositis has tons of biologic, what we call biologic agents. These are more specific agents that target specific molecules in the inflammatory or immune pathway. And there's tons of them that are being investigated for dermatomyositis at various stages, although none of them, at least to my knowledge, are at the stage yet that they're being, <clears throat> um, they're approved or actively being used. And then for IBM, there's been a lot of excitement recently with different drugs, some of which haven't worked in some show more promise. 
The magramab is, a, is an immune um, uh, antibody drug. Uh, I'll show you something about that in a second. And then aramoclamol. The exciting thing about aramoclamol is that it's not an immune mechanism. So uh, it's almost like we've, we've come to this point where we say, you know what, it doesn't seem to be, you know, there's inflammation, but it doesn't seem to be responding the way that traditional immune therapies respond, uh, immune mediated myopathies respond. So maybe we should take a different tack. And aramoclamol is a drug that increases um, the activation of what we call uh, heat shock proteins, which are proteins that live in your cells and they help cells respond to stresses by getting rid of um, uh, damaged proteins, for example, and accumulating proteins, just as an example. And it seems that those heat shock proteins are deficient in the muscle of, muscles of patients with IBM. And so the theory is that, you know, is it possible that IBM is, is due to a deficiency in those kinds of proteins and so they accumulate and they damage the muscle over time rather than the inflammation being the primary issue. And so aramoclamol is a drug that um, increases the activation of those um, uh, heat shock proteins. And um, there is some very preliminary data that shows some efficacy, though nothing to the point that we can actually start using it. But the excitement is to the point that actually in 2019, the FDA in the States fast-tracked aramoclamol for investigation for IBM so that it's on a track that uh, can expedite its um, usage or approval, uh, for example, if it is shown to be effective. And then bimagramab, which is a more immune-directed drug, I'll just show you this, for example, is really an excellent study from in a really good journal from 2019, the Resilient Study, with world leaders uh, in this area all involved. Unfortunately, it was a negative study, so they gave patients with IBM differing doses of bimagramab versus placebo. And they looked at one of the outcomes was how far, how, sorry, uh, um, how far you can walk in six minutes, basically. And there was no difference between the placebo and the bimagramab group, which, is, which was disappointing because there were some early signs that it might uh, improve some muscle parameters in IBM. But um, I only show this not as a, um, not to, um, uh, in, as a pessimistic way, but actually as an optimistic way to say that there is active research ongoing and very rigorous studies to try to find medications that can help patients, especially with diseases like IBM, where we don't have any active treatment um, at the moment. So I'll stop there. Sorry if I went over. Um, thanks very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Excellent. So how about we hold off on questions until the end, um, but then uh, perhaps Dr. Massey, you can go ahead and share your screen now as I introduce uh, you. Um, thank you again. So next we have Dr. Rami Massey speaking on autoimmune neuropathies. Dr. Massey is a neurologist specializing in neuromuscular disorders. His clinical activities consist of seeing patients in the EMG laboratory, in the ALS clinic, and in the neuromuscular clinic, with a particular interest in disorders of peripheral nerves. He also works in the Montreal General Hospital Neuropathy Clinic. He collaborates with the peripheral nerve surgeons and the neuropathologists to elucidate etiologies of peripheral neuropathies. Dr. Massey's area of research is mainly clinical. In addition to participating in clinical drug trials in the field of ALS and peripheral neuropathies, he supervises fellows and resident research projects in neuromuscular disorders. He's also responsible for the monthly Neuromuscular Journal Club, which brings together all the neuromuscular uh, specialists in the province. Thank you so much again for joining us, Dr. Massey. Unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, you sound great. Thank you. Yeah, okay, good. So thank you for the introduction, Hamira, and thank you for the invitation. I have to say this is going to be a tough act to follow. Um, I think Dr. Kasarjan was a great speaker and summarized and explained the autoimmune myopathies very well. So if somebody doesn't understand or if I'm going too fast, please let me know and I'll try to slow down. So I was asked, so sorry, th these are my disclosures. Um, I work with a little bit uh, with everybody. Um, so I was asked the same questions uh, as uh, Dr. Kasarjan um, for uh, the autoimmune neuromuscular neuropathies. So what are those autoimmune neuromuscular neuropathies in particular, the signs and symptoms of the neuropathies, the current treatment options, um, and the clinical trials and research. So, um, this is a list, um, a simple list of uh, autoimmune peripheral neuropathies. 
And as you can see, I highlighted the two main topics I will discuss, which is Guillain-Barré syndrome um, or, uh, and, and uh, CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. Um, and I will spend most time on these two syndromes. I have a slide at the end on multifocal motor neuropathy. Um, there's other neuropathies that are caused by inflammation and that are immune mediated, but I will not discuss them because they are often associated with more diffuse systemic disease, um, such as neuropathies due to inflammation of the blood vessels leading to the nerves. These are called vasculitis or vasculitic neuropathies. And one of those neuropathies is actually triggered by diabetes and um, other neuropathies associated with connective tissue disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupin or Sjogren's syndrome. So I won't talk about this because they're often associated with those systemic disorder and I will focus mainly on the neuropathies uh, that are involve uh, the, the, the peripheral nerves uh, by themselves. So let's start immediately with Guillain-Barré syndrome. So as the name implies, GBS is a syndrome that encompasses all acute immune-mediated neuropathies. And what does that mean? So um, they're acute so they're, or, or subacute. They're presenting rapidly within four weeks. Um, so they have to reach the worst. So, so symptoms reach the worst of their weakness, usually within four weeks. So they progress very, very fast. Um, and by definition, you have significant progressive symmetric weakness with absent or depressed uh, reflexes. That's why um, we often examine the reflexes in the emergency room or in the clinic. So there's multiple subtypes of Guillain-Barré syndrome. Some of those subtypes will affect the um, myelin, which is the covering of the nerves, and some will affect the nerve itself. Sorry, let me, um, yeah, let me show you that here. So this is a typical nerve. You see the nerve here in yellow, uh, and around the nerve you have um, those blue um, um, covering of the nerve. They're, they basically isolate the nerve, which allows the nerve to um, conduct electricity much faster. So some of those autoimmune neuropathies will attack the myelin sheath, um, um, which is composed of fat, and other autoimmune um, neuropathies will attack directly the axon, um, often at the site here in between those myelin sheath, um, or at the end, or at the beginning. Um, so when they attack the myelin sheath, we call them demyelinating, and when we at they attack the axon, so the nerve itself, we call it uh, axonal. Um, in both cases, sorry here, in both cases, uh, symptoms are similar. And you can really tell the difference between demyelinating and axonal uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome only uh, when you do the EMG, the, the test where we shock um, uh, the, the nerves and record uh, from the muscles and the nerves. So in both cases, the symptom and the presentation are similar. Most cases start with sensory symptoms in the legs, so numbness, tinglings, to, uh, that start in the toes, the feet, and rapidly progress up to the legs. Um, often, not always, but often they're preceded by significant and severe back pain. Um, and they're followed by significant weakness and paralysis of the legs, the arms, and a potential paralysis of the facial muscles, the bulbar muscles, the swallowing muscles, and the respiratory muscles. There's a very strong association with autonomic dysfunction in Guillain-Barré. So what does that mean? The autonomic nervous system uh, is comprised of the nerves that um, subserve uh, automatic function, such as heart rate, uh, bowel and bladder function, um, or um, um, blood pressure regulation. So uh, people can have um, very high, high uh, heart rates, so tachycardia, they can have loss of urinary control and go in urinary retention, so being unable to pee um, as part of the Guillain-Barré syndrome. Like I said, there's multiple types of Guillain-Barré syndrome. They're all treated relatively similarly, but they have different prognosis for improvement. So in uh, North America and in Europe, the most common site is called, uh, the, the most common type is called AIDP which stands for Acute Inflammatory Demyelinating Polyradiculoneuropathy. Um, the demyelinating means that we're attacking the myelin sheath, the covering of the nerve. 
Um, and usually this has a better prognosis than when the nerve itself is damaged. Um, so there's more likely to be uh, improvement when you have AIDP compared to AMAN or AMSAN. AMAN refers to acute motor axonal neuropathy, and AMSAN is acute motor and sensory axonal neuropathy. Um, they're both very similar. In both cases, they're much more common in uh, East Asia, in India, Bangladesh, China, or Japan, um, where they can go up to 25 or 30 percent of GBS are actually from AMAN or AMSAN. And what's particular about these axonal forms is that they're often triggered by a diarrheal illness uh, provoked by Campylobacter jejuni, which is a bacteria known to cause uh, bacterial gastroenteritis. So when you have uh, that bacteria, um, uh, you're, you're at higher risk of getting Guillain-Barré syndrome. Actually, um, my son had it a year at Christmas, two and a half years ago. Um, it wasn't very pleasant, and, but luckily he, he didn't get uh, Guillain-Barré. I kept making sure he was able to go up the stairs uh, during that episode. Um, right, and then the, the last subtype um, is called Miller-Fisher syndrome. Can you still hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, Miller-Fisher syndrome is much more rare than the other subtypes, and usually you don't have a lot of weakness, maybe 20% only. Uh, of patients with Miller-Fisher will have weakness. Most of the time you have involvement of your eye muscle. So you have ophthalmoplegia, meaning eye muscle paralysis. So you have double vision. You also have loss of reflexes and you have ataxia, which means balance problems. So you have a lot of difficulty walking because of the balance problems, but not because of the weakness. And you have um, double vision, um, but you're not as likely to have weakness and to have a severe involvement uh, that requires intensive care unit. So what is the treatment of Guillain-Barré syndrome? Well, the mainstay of treatment and really what saves lives is supportive care. Meaning what? Meaning that if you have a lot of difficulty breathing and that if your nerve that goes to your diaphragm becomes paralyzed and you can't breathe, at least we can support your breathing system and the intensive care units. So some patients require uh, a, a tube uh, and to be attached to a ventilator. Um, and that's really what makes the biggest difference in terms of survival from Guillain-Barré syndrome. We can also attend to other symptoms. So when you have a lot of autonomic dysfunction because of the, the heart rate going too fast, or you know, you, if you can't pee, um, we can address that often in the intensive care unit. And then we shouldn't forget pain. There's a good proportion of patients with Guillain-Barré syndrome who have a lot of pain, usually early in the disease, and rarely uh, it persists chronically. And you know we shouldn't forget uh, uh, about treating that. So I think people who have heard of uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome have heard of the two mainstay of treatment, um, IV IG or IV immunoglobulins or plasmapheresis. So immunoglobulins are those small antibody molecules that everybody has and that are used to fight against uh, infection. And um, um, what we can do is when people give blood, um, we can harvest these immunoglobulins of multiple people, dozens and dozens of people, put them together and then reinfuse them um, in somebody who has a disease with the hope that these antibody will attack the bad antibodies that the patient who has Guillain-Barré syndrome has and to neutralize those bad antibodies. Plasmapheresis is the opposite. You filter your blood of those antibodies that you already have. So people, so we, we put an IV in, we take out all the blood, pass it through a machine that filters out the, the antibodies that can be causing your symptoms and put that back your own blood in your system. And the studies have shown clear benefits, both from IVIG and plasmapheresis. And head-to-head -head studies of IVIG and plasmapheresis have not shown any one agent to be superior to the other. So they're both equivalent. And um, um, so the American Academy of Neurology recommends either plasmapheresis, that we often call PLEX, or IVIG for patients who cannot walk, so non-ambulatory patients, or for patients who can still walk but are worsening quickly within two to four weeks of symptom onset. There's no benefit of starting with one agent and switching to another agent, uh, or at least there's no proven benefit um, 
although it is a practice that is often done in multiple places. And finally, I think it's important to mention that there has been studies looking at steroids, either oral prednisone or IV steroids, um, and um, as opposed to multiple other uh, immune-mediated disorders, uh, steroids don't seem to work in uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome. Um, we're not quite sure why. Uh, smaller studies even suggest that they may harm, but uh, they, and I think that's not definite, but clearly they don't, they don't help recovery. All right, so this is, you know, so Guillain-Barré is a devastating disease. Um, you know, some patients can have a very mild form and recover quickly by themselves without any treatment, but some patients are um, uh, in the intensive care units on a ventilator for several weeks, and they, some patients require one year, two years, three years, uh, and they don't recover completely and have severe residual weakness. So clearly, we haven't um, um, uh, achieved satisfactory uh, treatments yet, um, and we haven't improved in terms of treatment in the last 25 or 30 years. However, there's new promising drugs. There's a drug called Ecolizumab, which um, is an antibody developed in, uh, in, in the laboratory. So it's a monoclonal antibody that will attack the complement system. So what is that? The complement system is what's, what destroys the nerves after the antibody have um, attached to the nerve. So um, we think that there is some antibody that is mediating Guillain-Barré syndrome. So the bad antibodies that you have will attach to your own nerves. And then the complement system will come and bind to those bad antibodies and will destroy the nerve. So what we're hoping is that if you inhibit that complement system, um, even if you have bad antibodies binding to your nerves, eventually those antibodies will go away by themselves. And at least there won't be destruction of the nerve. So ecolizumab was studied in myasthenia gravis, and it is actually approved as a resort, as a, as a almost last resort treatment for myasthenia gravis. Um, and um, um, it was studied in Guillain-Barré syndrome. We had a, a phase two study, which officially was negative, but still had some promising results. Um, um, two patients had severe side effects and died from those severe side effects. One patient had an anaphylactic reaction. Another patient had a brain abscess. So this is not a benign drug to be given lightly, but um, in cases of severe Guillain-Barré syndrome, that should be considered. Um, and and I, I think they're planning to do a phase three study, so a more advanced study to see if that can help. Other agents are being tested. Um, um, other agents are being tested and some modification to the current protocols are also being tested, um, such as a second course of IVIG. Often we give five days of IVIG. So there's a, a study looking at whether giving uh, a second course of IVIG two weeks later would help uh, and different patterns of plasma phoresis are being tested. All right, so moving on. So GBS uh, or Guillain-Barré syndrome is an acute immune mediated neuropathy uh, as I said, it's, you know, the worst uh, plateau happens after within four weeks. The second immune-mediated neuropathy that I'll be talking about is CIDP, uh, which stands for Chronic Inflammatory Demyelinating Polyneuropathy. So, you know, often people have heard of GBS but haven't heard of CIDP, and I often summarize it by, simply by saying that CIDP is like a chronic, slowly progressive form of Guillain-Barré syndrome. So by definition, symptoms have to progress um, in um, over eight weeks. So uh, you continue worsening over a slower period of time. You have to have signs of inflammation. You have to have signs of myelin problem. Again, the covering of the nerve rather than the axon itself on EMG. And what does that do? That gives you a slower time to conduct the electricity along the nerve. And that's why the EMG is so important to diagnose CIDP because you wanna see that the nerves are conducting the electricity much more slowly. Um, and then uh, it's called a polyneuropathy, but often we call it a polyradiculoneuropathy. What does that mean? Radiculo means nerve roots. So the nerve roots are the part of the nerve that immediately exits the spinal cord. So the very beginning, beginning of the nerve. So the, often the inflammation isn't only in the nerve itself, in the arm or in the leg, but a lot of inflammation is actually at the level of the nerve root, which is immediately after the nerve exits the spinal cord. 
And that's why, because of all this inflammation in the root, when we do a lumbar puncture, we often have signs of some inflammation on the lumbar puncture, um, and we have increased amount of protein in the cerebrospinal fluid, which surrounds those nerve roots. So what's typical of CIDP is that usually you have a, a progressive course over more than eight weeks, and you have both proximal and distal weakness, um, significant weakness. You can obviously have pain, but it's a less prominent feature than in GBS or than in other types of neuropathy. Of course, you, some patients have pain in CIDP, but there's a lot of patients, and I would say the vast majority of patients don't have pain in CIDP. And usually it's a relatively symmetric process. So if, if it's only one leg or um, there's a big difference between the two sides, it's less likely to be CIDP. So when I compare the symptoms of CIDP to the symptoms of Guillain-Barré syndrome, they're very similar. The main difference is that, you know, in one case they started within four weeks and in another case they start in over eight weeks. The other main differences, and I highlighted them here, is that there's less pain and certainly there's less back pain in uh, CIDP, and there's less autonomic dysfunction, so less dizziness, less urinary retention, and less heart rate variability. Um, but in both cases, you have onset of sensory symptoms in the legs that progressively go up to the thighs, the arms, the hands. Um, sometimes it starts in the hands rather than in the feet, uh, in both cases. Uh, and in both cases, you have ascending weakness and paralysis um, in the arms and the legs. Uh, usually, you don't have as much respiratory or bulbar involvement in CIDP. It's actually very, very rare. All right, so, you know, a few years ago, there was a lot of articles talking about overdiagnosis or misdiagnosis of CIDP. Um, and um, I think it's a bigger problem in the United States than here in Canada, but I think it can still happen here in Canada, where um, there's a very strong urge for us neurologists to find a treatable cause for the neuropathy of patients, which is totally understandable and legitimate. You know, a lot of neuropathies cause numbness, tingling, balance problem, and are quite disabling. And we feel that we wanna help. So uh, we don't wanna miss a diagnosis that is potentially treatable like CIDP. Um, so, um, obviously, you know, that, that's, that, you know, we don't want to miss that, but in the same time, overdiagnosing CIDP is not a good thing. We don't want to be giving those immune treatments, which potentially have side effects for a long period of time, um, in patients who don't need them or, and, or, or who do not benefit from them. So if you have only distal weakness without any proximal weakness, this still means you know, weakness in the hands or in the feet and the ankles and the wrist, as opposed to proximal weakness like Dr. Kasarjian uh, explained around the shoulders or around the hips. So if your shoulders or hips are strong but you have distal weakness only, that's typical of length dependent neuropathy and less typical of CIDP. If you have no weakness at all, but a lot of numbness, tingling without any weakness, and if you have severe disabling pain, that's less likely to be found in CIDP. All right, so how do we treat? Um, so, you know, the same as most inflammatory um, or immune mediated um, disorders, we treat with uh, immunomodulation or immunosuppression. So immunoglobulins like Guillain-Barré syndrome can be given, but they should be given more chronically rather than just five days in a row. Um, we can also give corticosteroids, which are, are clearly found to be effective. I would say that the first two options are the first line of treatment, and both of them work well, but immunoglobulin work much faster than corticosteroids. Um, plasmapheresis is also a good option, but it requires often an IV catheter. Sometimes it requires not just an IV in your vein, but an IV in deeper veins, what we call a central line. So there's more risk of complication with plasmapheresis. It's harder to organize um, and it's not available in more remote areas. So this is usually used only as a third line. All three treatments are equivalent, um, but immunoglobulin and plasmapheresis work faster than corticosteroids. So these are first line drugs. So what do I do when I see a new CIDP patient? I often start them on IVIG. If they're very severe and can't walk, I sometimes start them on both IVIG and corticosteroids in the same time. 
Um, and if they fail these treatments, then I try to switch them to plasma phoresis. Then the question becomes, are you committed to this treatment forever? And um, um, there's no one answer. Um, our goal is always to keep the least amount of treatment that's the best amount of function. So after we start this treatment, we often try to space out the treatment or decrease the dose. And if we see that the patient worsens while we do that, obviously we restart the treatment at the previous frequency, but sometimes we try to add an immunosuppressant long-term. And I have to say, there's absolutely no study that shows that any of those immunosuppressants are useful. There's some reports of a uh, number of cases, but no proven study that shows that they're useful. So I've tried as a thioprin or imiran in some patients without much success, I have to say. I've never tried CELCEPT. Um, and we reserve rituximab or cyclophosphamide to the most refractory cases. Um, and sometimes it, it, it does help. Rituximab is supposed to be very useful in one special type of CIDP where you have antibodies at the level of the node of Rambier. The node of Rambier is that junction here between the myelin. So right that hole in, in, in between is called the node of Rambier. And there's some specific antibodies in CIDP that represents you know, probably 2% of all CIDP patients, so very rare. But if you have those antibody, rituximab is supposed to be the best treatment for you. Um, all right, and then one last word on research and CIDP. So um, there's a lot of research in CIDP. I've chosen to talk about the most in vogue uh, treatments, which um, are very promising. Uh, instead of instead of um, giving the patient loads of antibody to suppress the bad antibodies, we can give molecules that target directly those bad antibodies and hope to reduce, to, to increase the degradation of those bad antibodies. Um, so um, they, they target some specific receptors called FCRN receptor on those bad antibodies and they block them, which increases the degradation of those bad antibodies. So two, two, two molecules have been studied so far. One is called FGAR TG mods, and the other one is called Rosanolo Lixizumab. Um, and both have positive phase two studies in myasthenia gravis or in, um, um, so myasthenia gravis is a disease of the neuromuscular junction, or in ITP, which is a disease of the platelets. And there are phase two studies for these two drugs in CIDP. Um, and I don't think we have the results of those yet. All right, one quick word on multifocal motor neuropathy or MMN. MMN is thought to be like CIDP, but with only motor symptoms without any weakness, well, well, sorry, without any sensory symptoms. So patients often present with progressive weakness, especially in their hands. So distal weakness in the hands, not in the shoulders. And they present with asymmetric hand atrophy because they lose sometimes their muscles in their hands. There's no sensory symptoms. And sometimes people can misdiagnose uh, multifocal motor neuropathy as ALS because of the lack of those um, sensory symptoms. And there's nothing that makes me happier, to be honest, than when I get a referral in the ALS clinic for a question of ALS. And when I think they may have something else like multifocal motor neuropathy, I give them IVIG, I see them in follow-up in three months and they're a lot better. So, um, you know, um, so that's very gratifying to not only not make the diagnosis of ALS, but see the improvements with IVIG. Unfortunately, plasma exchange and steroids don't work. So uh, there's not a lot of second line options if IVIG doesn't work. Um, you're a little bit stuck. And unfortunately, IVIG doesn't work in maybe 20 or 25% of patients. But at least people don't progress as fast or as severely as uh, CIDP or Guillain-Barré syndrome, and a lot of them can still remain quite functional. I'm going to stop there. I'm just going to cover CIDP, Guillain-Barré, and multifocal motor neuropathy, and I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you very much. Um, so what I have here are just uh, being mindful of time, but we have a couple of questions that were sent in. One is um, uh, this individual has a 14 year old daughter turning 15 and they have GBS. Um, the question is, and they work in a, um, a tertiary center treating children with complex needs and they are wearing a uh, regular mask. Does this put their daughter with GBS at risk? Dr. Massey, can you answer this question or provide some support? Of course, um, sure. So, you know, I, I think it's a lot of common sense when we deal with these COVID related questions. Um, I think no matter what, you still have to have uh, as, uh, you, you, you know, um, uh, proper hygiene, hand hygiene, um, uh, even, uh, you know, washing your hands, changing your clothes when you come back from work. Um, we listen, you know, at, in Quebec, in the province of Quebec, we have recommendations about who to stop um, when they, um, who to stop from working when, with certain disorders, and certainly people who are immunosuppressed, um, so people who are taking prednisone or other immunosuppressants, we recommend to stop them from work to, in order to decrease their exposure to uh, COVID. Right now, there's no recommendation to stop people from working if they live with somebody who is immunosuppressed. Your daughter isn't immunosuppressed. She can uh, have, she can mount a good immune response if she um, gets uh, sick. So, um, um, but you know, she may be, uh, so she's not at higher risk of, of, of uh, getting COVID, um, but she may be a little weaker from having had uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome. So I would just suggest basic precautions, you know, so hand washing, um, you know, not sharing the same towel, um, but um, nothing else in particular. Great, thank you so much. The next question that we got is I tested negative for ACHR antibodies, but have symptoms of myasthenia gravis. Is it possible for long-term use of high dose calcium channel blockers to present these symptoms after 17 years? Uh, do you think I should test for Lambert-Eaton? Uh, Dr. Massey or Dr. kessler Sure, um, so, um, so I can clearly answer that long-term use of calcium channel blocker does not, there's absolutely no link of, with that and uh, myasthenia gravis or Lambert-Eaton. It's not the same type of calcium channels that are blocked. So there's no risk with calcium channel blocker and those immune mediated neuromuscular junction defects. Now, um, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to say if you have myasthenia gravis or Lambert-Eaton. Usually when we do the EMG, um, we can clearly tell them apart. So I'm not convinced you need to be tested for Lambert Eaton in terms of the antibody, but certainly during the EMG, there's a small test we can do to look for Lambert Eaton, which is to make you exercise for 10 seconds and track you before those 10 second exercise and after those 10 second exercise. So that would be a reasonable test to do in EMG. Thank you. And then the last question that we received is, can you be diagnosed without supporting positive labs? And it was, can you be diagnosed with an autoimmune? So their rheumatologist diagnosed them with derm dermatomyositis and mixed connective tissue disease, but their labs never matched these diagnoses. He stated it didn't matter uh, due to typical skin presentations of DM and symptoms. Sure, I can, I can start with this one. Um, so that's a bit of a challenging question. I mean, usually we like to see some sort of um, additional evidence of uh, a diagnosis, um, for example, uh, and it doesn't have to be all of them. So uh, some biopsy evidence, um, antibody evidence, CK evidence, or EMG evidence. Having said that, um, you could make an argument that in someone who has a classic dermatomyositis picture, so those um, rashes that I showed you in the pictures of, for example, and if you have, for, uh, for example, uh, proximal muscle weakness, that there really isn't anything else that presents that way. And so you could make the argument that you don't really need any additional tests. You know, that's not necessarily how I practice, and I'm not sure that, that you know, I, I would like to have that additional information for the reasons that I outlined today to confirm the diagnosis, but also because sometimes those antibodies and other things can help us uh, gauge risk of cancer, um, and other organ involvement. So I think they're useful pieces of information, but um, you don't necessarily always need them. Um, I think most of us would probably try to get those uh, pieces of information. But uh, if you have the classic presentation, I think there's very little else that it could be diagnostically. I don't know, Rami, how you feel about that. But... Yeah, 
sure. I mean, it's very hard to answer without mm -hmm. more details, but uh, usually in order to be diagnosed with mixed connective tissue disease, you need to have some evidence that you have multiple involvement. And usually there is some abnormalities on the lab test. So even if you don't have the specific antibody that uh, gives you dermatomyositis, if you clearly are known to have mixed connective tissue disease and you have some antibody evidence of that, and then you present with increasing muscle enzyme, I think it's, it's pretty convincing that you have some inflammation in the muscle. So I would be comfortable calling this dermatomyositis when you're increasing muscle enzyme, clearly face you know, uh, some rash, um, but you know, I would want some evidence that you have connective tissue disease on antibody testing. And usually they have, you know, rheumatologists, um, usually you have some type of evidence, often they go by the ANA, uh, which is one of the antibody tests. Um, so if you have evidence of that, I'd be comfortable calling you dermatomyositis, even without the specific antibody. Excellent. Thank you so much. So to, to end today's webinar, I would like to thank our speakers for sharing their insights and to the mission team at Muscular Dystrophy Canada for their ongoing work in supporting individuals with autoimmune neuromuscular disorders. Thank you to Alexan Pharmaceuticals for helping support education initiatives. If you'd like to learn about myasthenia gravis, which wasn't mentioned in today's webinar, there is a recording of that webinar on our YouTube page. As always, we encourage you to email us at research at muscle.ca if you have any questions. And thank you again for joining. Thank you so much. Have a great day.